Words of Joy and Hope Seventh Sunday in Ordinary Time Year C Luke chapter 6 verses 27 to 38 Commentary by Father Fernando Armelini A good Sunday to all Last Sunday Jesus had addressed the disciples who had made the option to accept his life proposal by saying happy you being happy does not mean doing everything I tell them but it is a compliment they have secured their lives and the last of these beatitudes was happy when people hate you exclude you insult you the fact that the world does not love them means that they are different because if they were loved by the world, it means that they are the same as everyone else. On the other hand, the option of life that Jesus proposes you and that you have accepted is very different from the world. And when they, we say world, we understand those who follow the natural impulses in life. In today's gospel text, we will see that it is not so simple to accept the proposal of Jesus. It is very different from the one suggested by our instinct. Therefore, if as Christians you are not harassed, you would not have to Ask yourself and check if perhaps you have not turned into salt that loses its flavor and that only serves to be thrown out to be stepped on by people, as Jesus said. If the Christian reasons and speaks like everyone else, if he follows the same principle and values, if it suits the way of life of those who do not know the gospel, they will certainly leave you alone. You will not be persecuted. You do not bother anyone, but if Christians embodies gospel, he questions the established order of his life. It is inevitable that he be persecuted. Jesus says, happy you when you have this painful experience. It is then when one wonders how the disciple should behave when he is persecuted. When he finds himself in front of people, who do him wrong or use violence when he is marginalized, when he suffers injustices and may even lose his life. And it is not only an experience of the first centuries, it is an experience that church is living today too. What does the master say? The natural instinct leads people leads the disciples to react, to pay with the same coin, to respond to violence with violence, to evil, another evil, and with revenge. Listen to what Jesus asks of his disciples who are in this situation. Should they be carried away by the instinct or by new life they have received from the Father in heaven? The Spirit? Let us listen. Jesus said to his disciples, To you who hear, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. To the person who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other, other one as well. And from the person who takes your cloak, do not withhold even your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from the one who takes what is yours, do not demand it back. These are four unequivocal imperatives, followed by four practical examples taken from everyday life. Therefore, Jesus wants to be very clear with what he asks his disciples. When they suffer injustices and persecution, the first imperative, love your enemies. 
The verb used here is not the one translated by friendship, filet. It is another verb. You have ever have you ever wondered how can you be friends with those who have done wrong? You cannot do it. And it is clear it is not possible. Jesus does not ask you to be friends. He asks you to love him. The verb used here, agapan, it is the verb that a classical Greek literature, it is not used even a dozen times. It is very seldom used. But for Christians, it has become the word that indicates gratuitous love that does not originate in human nature. Human nature would like would take you in the opposite direction, but it originates in the life that has been given to you by the Father in heaven, which he which his very life. And his life is love. Agapan means availability to do good to do good only unconditionally. In the confrontation with the enemy that made me some, same, some evil and in a serious evil, the, and that in fact is doing everything possible to create problems for me. Doing good is not something that comes spontaneously. The natural instinct takes us in the opposite direction. Jesus asks for love, for the readiness to respond to the request for help even from the enemy. When the enemy has need, despite whatever evil he has done to me, I must put myself at his service. This is the first imperative, accept or reject it. But this is the personal, this is the proposal of Jesus of Nazareth. The second imperative, do good to those who hate you. Hatred is not simply antipathy or aversion that one feels against those who do not like you. These are feelings that we all have. The danger is that these feelings turn into hatred. The one who hates wants to destroy the other. He who hates me wants something bad to happen to me and thinks that it would be much happier if I, if I did not exist. If one hates me, the natural instinct, what is derived from my human nature, where does it lead me? It takes me to do everything possible to destroy him. He wants to destroy me, so I anticipate. I wish that some evil happens to him. Maybe he gets sick. This is responding to hatred to someone who wants to do me wrong with another hatred, this is derived from nature. It is clear that if one hates me, I will not like it. This does not depend on me. The danger is when this antipathy turns into hatred in me. In me the Spirit of Christ goes in the opposite direction. Jesus asks that all the opportunities should be sought to make him happy, to do him good. It is your enemy that hates you, that wishes to destroy you, that does not want, want you to exist in this world. And you should do everything possible to make him happy. Doing good does not mean caressing him. To indulge in his whims. This is not love for those who do us evil. Do good means make strong decisions in the confrontation with that person because you want to make him grow. You want to humanize him. He or she in, is in a condition in which if I concern with his whims, it will be worse for him. So I, can, I cannot do this. But I must do everything possible so that this person may, can, may grow, may be humanized, may be happy. In any case, the disciple of Christ cannot do anything but love him or her. Sometimes we ask ourselves, will it work? I do not know. It is that I being the child of God cannot do every, anything other than love him or her. Maybe the person will close more, will hate me even more, but I let myself be guided by the divine life. 
by the life of the Father in heaven who is love, when, even when the other person remains closed. I cannot do anything else. The wine cannot, can do nothing but produce grapes. It is, the, it is its nature. The jasmine cannot do anything but give perfume. It is its nature. Even if you step on it, it will continue to give perfume. The nature of the Christian is to be the son of God. He cannot do anything other than love. Even those who do him evil, those who hate him. Third imperative, bless those who curse you. Cursing means wanting the death of the other. Blessing means to wish life. We bless God when we recognize that all of life comes from him and God blesses by giving us life. When we bless another person, it means I want you to live and to live does not just mean to survive. It means that you may have the full, fullness of life, the fullness of joy. And when a Christian blesses someone who has cursed him, he means that he wants the other to be happy and that he is willing to do everything possible to make, make it so. And this is not easy. And that is why the fourth imperative. Pray for those who mistreat you. Practicing the first three imperatives is difficult and therefore prayer is needed. Only authentic prayer not the repetition of formulas, but the authentic prayer that means to get in tune with the thought of God. See how God sees the one who hates me, who do, not bad, who do bad things to me. And when I consider that God loves him, God is not telling me that the other is good and that everything is good. He tells me that his son is wonderful, even if he is doing, doing bad things. God hates the bad things he does, but he loves him. Only in prayer can, I can get in tune with the feelings of God. When we are before the Lord, we cannot lie. And we, can, and we ask him to fill with his blessings, who is doing evil to you. And when one prays in this way, the heart is in tune with the heart of the Father of Heaven, who makes the sun rise on good and bad, and make the rain fall over the righteous and the unjust. Now Jesus explains this proposal for a new world with four practical examples. Let us clarify immediately that here Jesus is using paradoxical images. Put the other cheek after you have been slapped. Do not take it to the, uh, to the letter. Not even Jesus has taken it to the letter. But, but let us try to understand what Jesus intends of his disciples. He wants them to let themselves be moved by his spirit of the divine life they have received, not by the impulses that come from nature and to the to present this law of unconditional love, these are the examples that Jesus gives. The first refers to physical violence. What should, a, what should the slave do? He says, offer the other cheek. It means you must not respond with violence. We experience many kinds of aggressions in our life. Even in the simplest, most banal moment, we cannot be, we can be on the road driving and we are next to the other cars, hoping, the f hoping to follow and behind is one that blows the horn. And with this, he is annoying. He is saying to me, you must not exist. It is a violence that is done to us. How to react? The Christian cannot react ex except with love. You must turn the other cheek. If you cannot change the situation, you must not react with violence. The second behavior. The robber who steals the first things uh, he, he finds. From the person who takes your cloak, do not withhold even your tunic. 
it is paradoxical. But if the one, if one day you find who has stolen your cloak, if you find him on the street and he is dying of cold, you must give him a tunic and you go cold and give, give it to your brother. You can accept or reject it, but this is the gospel. And the third example, do not look for excuses. Give to everyone who asks of you. It is the request for help. Sometimes it is done without discretion and it creates unpleasant situations, but you do not have to look for excuses. If you can help the brother, you must help him, even if he is an enemy. Attention on this is doing good, giving alms. Let us be vigilant. We have a beautiful phrase found in the book of Didache, a book written in Antioch, even before the Gospel of Matthew. It says, Keep the alms in your sweaty hands, in your sweaty hands, until you know who is best to give it. It's a impo very important phrase. Think well before giving alms, before doing some good to the other. Four. You must know how your help will be used. Therefore, wisdom when you, when, you, when you do good. The fourth example relates to economic justice. From the one who takes what is yours, do not demand it back. Someone who seizes something that is yours, how to react? Jesus is not saying that you should remain passive, resign yourself. No, the Christian is not naive or foolish. Jesus suggests a positive action to humanize the evil one. And the first thing is not to behave in the same way as the evil one. Therefore, the disciple is asked to do justice and defend what belongs to you, your own honor, your own life. The Christian is not an Im imbecile. He does not tolerate injustice, nor does love mean to endure in silence without reacting. The Christian is actively committed to en ending prevarications, pre robberies, injustice, but he does not use methods condemned by the gospel. When to establish justice with evangelical means is not possible, when the only way that remains open is to do evil to a brother. You must show yourself a disciple of Christ who prefers to bear the price of injustice rather than do evil to a brother or sister. And now comes what he has been what, what has been called the golden rule that Jesus gives Jesus has given to help us to make the right choices when we are not sure what to do. Listen. Do to others as you would have done them, you would have them to do to you. For if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend money to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners and get back the same amount. Jesus begins with a wise counsel. To know what to do, to help those who are in difficulty, and you do not know what option to take. Jesus suggests asking this question. If you were in a situation of the other, what you would what would you want the other to do for you? Treat others the way you want them to treat you. And then he introduces the theme of gratuity, of Christian love. What characterizes the agapan is the availability to do good for free without expecting anything in return. 
Many times, the translation of the text that we have just heard translates the parallel of Matthew who says, If you love those who love you, what merit do you have? If you do good to those who do good to you, what merit do you have? If you lend to those who turn, return the loan, what merit do you have? Matthew uses the term mythos, merit. But like, but Luke, with great fineness, uses another term, jaris, Harris. Harris, which means gratuity. So, the meaning of this term is diverse. If you love those who love you, what are you doing for free? And what characterizes the authentic love of Jesus of Nazareth is love that asks nothing in return. He does it in pure love, pure loss because he is happy, because he cannot do anything for anything other than love, than doing good. This is the Harris, the gratuity. If you do good to those who do good to you, where is the gratuity? This is done by all. It is derived from human nature. Doing good without expecting anything in return is the characteristic of the love of Christ. And doing good without expecting anything in return for free also refers to not doing good to accumulate merits in paradise. And this is still selfishness. It is not Harris. If I love the poor, then later there in paradise accum I accumulate merit. Then I am still an egoist. I have not entered into this Harris that characterizes the love of the disciple. It is this gratuitous love that transforms the person into an outstanding one, into a true disciple of Christ. Noble because from him or from her comes the light that characterizes the noble person who is Jesus of Nazareth. When Jesus says, you must be light of the world, it means you must let out of your lives the light that is my own life. And now we come to the apex of Christian ethics. Love of the enemy. But rather love your enemies and do good to them and lend expecting nothing back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Love for the enemy is the privileged situation where it is possible to show the gratuitousness of love. Only the total love of Jesus of Nazareth can reach this level. This proposal of Jesus has already been prepared by several texts of the Old Testament. We remember the book of Exodus. If you find the ox of your enemy or his donkey strayed, you will certainly return it to him. When you see the ace of your enemy fallen under his lord and you would like to, ref you would like to refuse to lift it, you must, however, help him to lift it up. If he loses the donkey, he no longer has the treasure, the resources to live. Help your enemy who is in need. Therefore, already in the Old Testament, even the pagan sages had similar and well-known expressions. For example, Epictetus say, who said, Even as the sun doth not wait for prayers and incarnations to ray, to rise, but shines forth and is welcomed by all, so you also wait not for cla clapping of hands and shout for praise to do the, your duty, nay, do good of thine own accord, and thou wilt be loved, loved by like the sun. 
Seneca says, if you want to imitate gods, do good to also to the, to the ungrateful, for the son who also rises over the wicked. These affirmations of the Stoic philosophers would seem identi identical to those of Jesus and those of the Gospel, but in reality they are very different because of the gratuity. The Stoic philosophers proposed these behaviors to achieve inner peace and imperturbability of facing suffering injustice. They wanted to show total control of themselves. Therefore, deep down, they, they were looking for themselves. They, they, there was no gratuity, and I have mentioned it before. It may also be the reason for Christians who seek a personal advantage for the good deeds done. Wrong. Good, good is done because it is good. The disciple should not be fooled by the selfish thought. Looking for some personal gratification, you will experience the joy of loving, which is the, that of the Father of Heaven. What is the promised reward? They will receive a great reward. What is it? They will be children of the Most High, who, who is generous with ungrateful and wicked. It is not the promise of a better place in paradise. No. The big reward, the biggest one, is that you will be son of the Most High. Be like him who loves and only loves. And God manifests his very identity as a God who loves, especially in the love of the enemy who does evil and the son or daughter of God behaves like the father of heaven because the evil person is also a person of God and from you should come out the expression of this father's life to love the wicked person. The text concludes with the exhortation for members of the Christian community to make this face of the Heavenly Father visible in the eyes of the people. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Stop judging and you will not be judged. Stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and gifts will be given to you. A good measure, packed together, shaken down and overflowing, will be poured into your lap. For the measures with which you measure will in return be measured out to you. This adjective, merciful, does not reproduce the meaning of the term rajum that the Bible attributes to God. When God appears in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, he says, Aini rajum, which, me, which is translated, I am merciful. Rahum, which is the first image of God, is a feminine image. It comes from Rehem, which is the mother's womb, the uterus. God presents his love as visceral, as motherly. It does not say the heart of God. It says the uterus. It is feminine because the heart we all have but the uterus only women and God has chosen this image to show his unconditional love for each person this does not mean that God says everything goes well no nobody like God hates evil for the first victim of evil is the one who commits it because evil dehumanizes the person and therefore God hates evil but he cannot do anything but love all people. Let us take the example of a mother. 
We have all heard the expression similar to these. When a mother is told, your son has committed a huge crime, what happens? The mother answers, no, my son is good. It's a crime, but my son is good. She reacts with the Rahum. This is a pale image of God's unconditional love for each son or daughter of His. God hates evil more than any other because evil is done to His children. But He loves each person reacting in this way, showing love for all, does not come to us spontaneously. We do not spontaneously love the one who does us wrong. God hates evil but loves all and loves specially the one who does evil. It does not come spontaneously to us, but this is the nature of God. In fact, by not being able not to love the, the worst criminal, the nature of God's love is manifested. Think of the blasphemy that is said when speaking of a God that punishes those who have no excuse to destroy His commandments and dis disobey His commandments. It is a blasphemy against God's identity, which is His unconditional love. And because God is, God is like that, we, His sons and daughters, must be like Him. Hate evil, but love, the, love and only love when the, even the greatest criminal. What must be done to make him make this happen? Two behaviors that must be avoided and two behaviors that must be assumed. Avoid. First, do not judge and do not condemn. What does Jesus mean by not judging and not condemning? Does it mean that we have to turn a blind eye to everything and deny mistakes as if they were not? No. We must always distinguish between the judgment we make about an action that has been carried out and the judgment of people. The one who judges is the, the word of the gospel. It tells you even if, if an option is humanizing or dehumanizes you. The word indicates the good invites to discern, but it does not condemn the person. It condemns the deed. God does not judge, does not condemn anyone. If we judge and condemn, we are condemning God who does not condemn. He only loves. These are the things that must be avoided so as not to be judged and condemned. Some say, I do not judge or condemn, so God will not judge and condemn me. Wrong. It is not like that. Otherwise, we are wrong. We still think of a God who condemns. If I judge the other, I assume as a criterion that I can be condemned. I am condemning myself. If we follow this principle of condemning, we are in the condition of being condemned ourselves. What must be the con what must be condemned is evil, sin, and not the sinner. The person cannot be judged because to judge means to tie the person to be to the bad action that is that has committed no bad action is one thing but the person is someone you have to love if we assume the thought that the feelings of god we will see these people as worthy of love forgive and you will be forgiven forgive this verb to forgive in greek polu ein Pardoned by, uh, it means to say, un, to untie. It means 
not having the rope around the neck tied to people who have made a mistake. Separate the person from that mistake and that way you too will be, you will be spared. This is very beautiful because if we let others out of their mistakes, we end up letting ourselves go of our mistakes. To live happily, we must untie ourselves from the mistakes we have made. We do not deny them, but we look at them serenely, knowing that God does not have, have us tied to our mistakes, does not wait for us to call us on account and for punishment. No. We realize that there has been a, a mistake. We see what we can do to repair this mistake so as to not repeat it. But by unleashing others, we untie ourselves. Finally, give and gifts will be given to you. A good measure, packed together, shaken down and overflowing will be pulled into your lap. For the measure with which you, you measure will be in return be measured out to you. What does this giving mean? Giving means giving everything. We return to blessed uh, to the blessed are the poor. Those who have detached themselves from everything, those who have made their lives a gift, they will receive a generous measure, abundant in proportion to what they have given, receive a gift without measure. What is this gift? It is not a better place in paradise. This gift is a greater resemblance to the Father of Heaven, who donates everything. The more we donate, the measure of resemblance to the Father of Heaven will increase. We wish everyone a good Sunday and a good week.